Michael James Genovese was a powerful mobster in Pittsburgh's Cosa Nostra crime family, and despite reports, was not a close relation to New York gangster Vito Genovese. Let's check him out. Welcome to OC Shorts, bringing you detailed historical snapshots of the American Mafia and other organized crime. Feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. Today, I'll be taking a quick look at Pittsburgh powerhouse Michael James Genovese with the help of mob historian Paul Hodus, author of the book Steel City Mafia. Many sources often erroneously state that Michael James Genovese was a first cousin to Vito Genovese. Coincidentally, Vito did have a brother called Michael, but the Pittsburgh Michael Genovese was not directly related to the New York powerhouse. Mob historian Paul Hodes conducted some research into this. Basically, there might have been some uh, relations uh, between the two back, like, if you go as far as back to, like, the mid-1800s, um, in a t little town called Rocheranola, which is where both Mike and Vito were uh, hail from, just outside of Naples. Um, but that they would have been very distant relatives. It's not the kind of relatives that you would have seen at a uh, at a family reunion or anything like that. Um, they were, you know, those two families were close because the Genovese family represented the Pittsburgh family on the commission. But as far as blood ties goes, um, there, there really wasn't a strong one there. Michael James Genovese was born on April the 9th, 1919, to Tony and Ursula Genovese, who lived in the Larimer neighborhood of Pittsburgh. Mike Genovese had an older brother, Felix, known as Phil, who was also in organized crime, and a younger brother, Fiore, who was a trusted associate, but not a serious criminal figure. Michael Genovese's first brush with the law came in September 1936, when he punched a man in a robbery. Mob historian Paul Hodus expands on Michael Genovese's early rise in the Pittsburgh underworld. In, in the 40s, um, in, during World War II, um, some uh, law enforcement informants said that he was a uh, fresh young kid trying to come up in organized crime and that he basically came up with this scheme whereby he was going to get arrested and then he wouldn't be drafted into World War II. Um, and indeed, in the 40s, he was arrested for uh, walking suspiciously, is what it says in the police report, and then also carrying a gun and a blackjack. Um, and he did not have to serve in the military. So if if what those informants say was true, um, it did work and he was able to uh, stay in the area and you know continue to uh, cultivate his underworld career. Um, and then sort of the, the next uh, bit of information comes in the 50s, talks about him uh, being active in the numbers rackets and horse betting and sports betting um, and uh, doing uh, some joint uh, businesses with John LaRocca um, where, uh, where there were a few, you know, I don't know if there were mob fronts or not, but, uh, you know, ostensibly legitimate enterprises with the boss of the Pittsburgh family that would rise up in the late 1950s. Um, and after that, uh, you next hear about him as John LaRocca's protege. John LaRocca eventually takes over the family after Frank Amato Sr., his predecessor, um, retires due to a kidney ailment. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he sort of retires, but he's still around, but he's advising the family more than, more than being active like he was. And, uh, John LaRocca, you know, takes that, takes the step and, and basically made it, makes it known on the street that Mike Genovese is going to be, uh, you know, the heir apparent, the person who's going to take over for him afterwards, which is a pretty rare thing too. You know, you don't send a boss and then name your successor, but that's what he did. Um, and, uh, you know, he felt that, uh, I, I think that he felt that that would mollify some of the younger guys that were loyal to Genovese and, you know, make it a very smooth transition from Amato to Rock. And he was probably made under Amato Senior in the early 1950s? 
yeah, there's no exact date on that, but uh, if if you do if you do the, you know, if you look at everything all together, that's what makes sense. Um, that he was made at that time under under the Amato regime. By 1957, Mike Genovese had reached such a standing in the underworld that he attended the disastrous Appalachian Mob Summit. Paul Hodas expands on how attending this event had an impact on Mike Genovese. So Appalachian was a disaster for the mob. Um, it was in some ways a disaster for J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, uh, because, you know, this big organization that nobody knew it nobody knew existed um you know suddenly suddenly there it was 100 people meeting at this estate uh for an un grand underworld meeting and uh mike genovese uh to his underworld credit um was invited to that meeting um and uh he was there and you know according to fbi formants uh he was there to uh talk about a scheme that a lot of families had to build hotels to launder money uh, some of their gambling profits through these, you know, ca cash, cash heavy businesses like, and hotels were the one that they chose. And the Pittsburgh family did actually build two hotels after the Appalachian summit. Um, so there was some successful uh, information passed during that, during that meeting, but mostly it was a disaster when, as all the bosses, uh, you know, r ran out of the house and into the woods or to their cars and tried to escape, uh, John LaRocca reportedly escaped on foot and got away. It was not documented as being there um, in person. But Mike Genovese and Kelly Manorino, another uh, heavyweight in the family, um, were caught in a car with two Buffalino family members. That's the Northeastern uh, Pennsylvania family um, that uh, shares the state with the Philadelphia family and the Pittsburgh family. Uh, they they were caught and their names were written down. And, you know, unfortunately for them, uh, unfortunately for Mike Genovese, he was uh, considered a top hoodlum in the FBI's top hoodlum program that emerged right after that. J. Edgar Hoover really wanted the FBI field offices to work the, the mafia very hard because uh, of the public attention from that summit. And, uh, you know, Mike Genovese, who was basically not bothered at all by law enforcement, except for, uh, you know, those two times we mentioned before, uh, you know, he started to get interviewed by the FBI. He started to get followed. Um, and as a result, he decided to become more secretive than he already was. He was already known as a secretive guy. He became even more so. He was known as kind of a nervous guy around law enforcement, and he became even more so. Um, and and uh, it also led to uh, him having to testify before uh, congressional committees um, one of which, you know, he was questioned by uh, Robert Kennedy. And there's a famous picture of him with his fingers in his mouth, looking very nervous. Um, he hated publicity. Uh, and, you know, his according to uh, informants and documents, he would get very angry when uh, the family was in the news and would would retreat for days at a time, refuse to talk business with anybody and, and basically shut him out, shut himself off for a little while. In order to calm down and let everything else calm down so he wasn't you know uh law enforcement couldn't make the connections um very often in the documents you'll see him uh telling his subordinates you know if he had a, a short stay in prison in the 70s he had a few months there he had a few months in the hospital he would say don't come visit me because i do not want law enforcement to know that you're you know that you're part of a part of our group and so they can't document it so, you know, kind of the exact opposite of Gotti, you know, who wanted everyone to come pay homage to him at the Ravenite. While other American Mafia families were supporting General Batista in Cuba due to their interest in casinos over there, at one point, the hierarchy of the Pittsburgh family were actually trying to supply guns to communist rebel leader Fidel Castro. And this was something that actually led to Mike Genovese becoming acting boss of the family for the first time, as Paul Hodos discusses. Yes, yeah, so uh, after Appalachian, um, just a year after, uh, the family got involved in, in a pretty risky uh, adventure. 
And uh, they own the San Suchi Casino down in Cuba, along with a few other families in the, in the, in the South, a few other smaller families. Um, and their interest in it was considered so vital uh, that they decided to do something pretty crazy, which so there was a robbery of a, of a military armory in Canton, Ohio, where uh, some uh, M1 Garand rifles were stolen. Um, and, uh, you know, you fast forward a, a little bit and the law enforcement is tipped off to uh, this scheme that was seems to have been led by the Manorino group. Uh, in the Pittsburgh family, which was uh, led by Sam and Kelly Manorino, two brothers who were very powerful. The brother Kelly went to Apple, went to the Appalachian Summit with Mike Genovese. Um, and Sam Manorino seems to have been more the head of this operation. Um, and so they uh, loaded up the guns, including a 50 caliber machine gun onto this plane at a little airport outside of Pittsburgh. Um, law enforcement was able to intercept the truck that brought the guns, but they weren't able to intercept the plane. So the plane was able to take off. Um, they did track it. They attempted to track it with uh, like military radar stations. That didn't really work because it was kind of flying too low. But they did track it in another way. Um, you know, they figured out where it was going to land to refuel. Um, and it was in West Virginia. And so they detained the plane in West Virginia and were able to recover the weapons uh, that were on it. And, you know, figured out that uh, the weapons were meant for Fidel Castro and his rebels down in Cuba to help them overthrow Fulgencio Batista because uh, they thought that some of Batista's actions, he was getting a, getting too greedy when it came to the specifically to the San Suchi Casino. And they wanted a change in the government of Cuba as a result. Um, and, you know, as I said, it's pretty, pretty. Uh, Pretty bold move, um, pretty foolish move, some might say, especially one year after Appalachian. The FBI is already on on their butts for uh, being at that meeting and following them all over the place and talking to them. And now, you know, there's this extra added heat. And there was so much heat that John LaRocca and Kelly Manorino um, went into the wind for a little while, hit out for a little while. Um, and as a result, um, the heir apparent who who uh, John LaRock had already made known, hey, this is going to be the guy in the future, uh, the boss in the future. Uh, Mike Genevieve has got his first chance to be the acting boss, and he was that for for a little while there in the in the late 50s and uh, was able to cut his teeth on the role. And uh, John LaRocca must have liked what he, how he acted because he allowed him to be in that role through the 60s and through the 70s when John LaRocca would take these vacations uh down to florida that would last from somewhere anywhere from three to six months he hated the heavy pennsylvania winters up there in the mountains where you get a lot of snow and a lot of cold and it really is freezing up there during winter time and get a lot of snow um and so he would go down there mike genovese didn't mind the cold he was kind of a pennsylvania home buddy so he would he would stay back and have the full powers of the boss he would check in with john laraca a lot via the phone but uh, he had, you know, the full powers of a boss while, while he was gone. In 1968, Mike Genovese suffered a heart attack and was hospitalized. He then spent a great deal of time recuperating at home. These heart problems would plague Genovese for over half a decade. According to some sources, due to his health, there were many mobsters who wrote off Genovese's chances of rising to the top of the family. However, Mike Genovese remained greatly feared. And after successful heart surgery in 1975, his rise up the crime family would continue. In 1971, tragedy struck Mike Genovese when his younger brother Fiore was murdered. A killing the Genovese was not allowed to avenge. As Paul Hodos discusses. It, it, it goes to uh, sort of the Pittsburgh family's philosophy about not c committing unnecessary murders and, and, uh, and also, uh, you know, their restraint. So there was a, uh, a bartender who, uh, worked in one of the family's establishments, um, called his name was Nicholas Gellarmini. And, uh, 
he he was made fun of by some of the mobsters. Um, his his main tormentor uh, was uh, Eugene Nick the Blade Jaswale, who we talked about in an earlier video. And he, uh, you know, took it for a while, you know, like a champ. But eventually he had had enough, apparently. Um, and uh, he decided to settle uh, settle scores with the people who were tormenting him. And uh, he, he was going to do that violently you know a lot of the guys he was hanging out with all day over over at the the bar where he worked you know that's how they handled handled their disputes you know in with violence some of them anyway and so he decided to do the same and uh the story is that he went after his main tormentor nick the blade and and uh nick the blade realized that something was wrong and, and didn't come out of his house um so eventually uh, Gellarmini gave up on Nick the Blade and was sort of just driving around the area. And he happened to see Mike Genovese's brother, Fiore, coming out of uh, an office building and uh, with an associate. And he fired at him from his car. And then he hopped out and finished him off uh, right there in the street. Uh, and then afterwards, he got into a shootout with the cops. Um, miraculously, he survived that and was captured alive. Um, and, you know, Obviously, Mike Genovese, uh, if if you believe uh, the FBI informants, wanted revenge. Uh, however, John LaRocca came back home and said, "Hey, no, we we've got to we've got to calm down. This isn't about business. Um, it was a it was a personal matter, and and the guy is clearly mentally unbalanced. Um, and we just have to we just have to leave it alone. We have to just let it go. It's not related to business. Um, and Mike." Mike Genovese must have conceded to that, and uh, and the person who shot his brother was was not punished by the mafia, but you know had to t under t had to have some punishment from the law. In the late 1970s, family boss John LaRocca started to step back and hand over leadership to a ruling panel consisting of Mike Genovese, Jojo Pecora, and Kelly Manorino, and these three would then vie to be the next in line to take over the family. Paul Hodos expands on how this played out with Mike Genovese eventually becoming boss in 1984. Compared to other families, it's uh, a pretty a pretty peaceful transition. The Pittsburgh family had a history of that uh, since the at, at least post-prohibition. Pre-prohibition is pretty violent. Post, the transfers of power are pretty, pretty good. Um, there would have been... Uh, some room for drama, I think, if certain things didn't happen. But uh, Kelly Manorino um, had a lot of gravitas in the Pittsburgh family, uh, very well respected, uh, a longtime member, a longtime leader. Um, it had been John LaRocca's underboss for a very long period of time. Um, and, uh, you know, he's the only one that could really equal Mike Genovese in stature, I'd say, uh, gangland stature. They were they had both gone to the Appalachian Summit. Um, and, uh, but the thing with Kelly was, is that, uh, Mike Genovese had some health problems in the mid seventies. There was some FBI informant reporting that Kelly was possibly looking to unseat him as the heir apparent, um, and, you know, making some maneuvers towards that. Um, Mike recovered from his health problems and, uh, you know, came back stronger than ever really. And so, uh, that didn't really happen. And then. What really took him out of the running was he died in 1980 before John LaRocca died. So John LaRocca died in December 1984. Um, Kelly Manorino dies in 1980, so he's out of out of the running. Um, Jojo Pecora was the other contender. Jojo Pecora had uh, helped Mike Genovese out, and this is according to older FBI documents from the 60s, early 70s. He was his, his driver for a while. He would do personal things for him. Um, he was always over at his house. Um, during that time period um, and uh, really it helped out his family in, in a lot of different ways um, during tough times that they experienced. Um, and, uh, you know, they seem definitely to be on on very friendly terms. Um, the reason Pecora is mentioned as a, as a possibility is because it seems like he might have been LaRocca's late in life favorite. LaRocca may have soured on Genovese a little bit because he was seen by the Pittsburgh Mafia rank and file as kind of arrogant and a little bit of a bully, uh, but Cora was seen in a much more positive light, sort of a, a, a jovial guy, somebody who could talk to anybody, 
Um, and uh, what happened was is that Cora was sort of the, the gambling king of the panhandle of West Virginia. Uh, he had a, a few illegal casinos there. Um, and those casinos made the Pittsburgh family a lot of money. And he was paying local politicians off in order to protect those casinos. Um, and he was, you know, sort of, sort of like the, you know, the shadow governor of West Virginia, you could call him. He had a lot of power down there. And so he, he was uh, moving along at a good pace. And uh, what, what tripped him up is that one of his guys tried to bribe a new sheriff. Um, in West Virginia, and that sheriff um, had had a lot of uh, moral scruples, so he decided to uh, report the attempted bribe to uh, law enforcement, and uh, they basically made a sting operation, and the, the sting operation eventually uh, captured Bacora, and uh, the charges weren't the charges weren't really heavy. He only went to went to prison for a little bit, but he was on probation for a long while. And why, when John LaRocca died, he was on probation. So that kind of took him out of the running. Um, they wanted a new boss that was free of any kind of legal entanglements. Uh, and when the Capos voted, they voted in Mike Genovese after, after LaRocca's death in December, 1984. And Pecora uh, became, because he was of high stature as well, he became the underboss um, and and unfortunately for him, he died shortly thereafter in 1987, just of natural causes. And, uh, and you know, that's when the Chucky Porter made his rise. But Pecora and Genovese were the original hierarchy uh, post LaRocca. So, what was Mike Genovese like as a boss? What attributes made him successful? So, I think the successful traits he had um and what allowed him to survive so long without going to prison despite the fact that the federal government and uh state government really were focusing on his family pretty intensely in the 80s and 90s less so less so post then because that because the family is pretty small uh but in the 80s and 90s what made him survive was working through intermediaries um basically uh keeping uh business as drama free as he could in, in Pittsburgh itself, especially where, where his stomping grounds were. You could say in, in Youngstown, things got a little, things got pretty crazy. Uh, there were a lot of hits out there because of the conflict with Cleveland. Uh, but he, in his really core territory, he kept things pretty quiet. Um, murders were rarer than I'd say in other families. Uh, you know, if you think about, John Gotti's tenure in New York or Nikki Scarfo's tenure in Philadelphia. And you contrast that with Mike Genovese, you know, those guys are announcing to the world, you know, they're in the newspapers all the time. Uh, there are a lot of murders, um, you know, Scarfo obviously being the worst offender as far as that goes. Um, and, uh, you know, you have Mike Genovese uh, talking about like, you know, people, a lot of people shouldn't meet. Uh, you know, don't meet, everybody can't meet together. And then you have, you know, John Gotti, like I said, like doing, having everybody come to the Ravenite and, uh, you know, the FBI has their cameras out there and they're taking pictures of them. Mike Genovese tried to avoid that type of uh, open meeting. Um, and, you know, he, he did make a, a mistake, uh, you know, with his uh, underboss Porter, uh, with drug, the drug trade, which made a lot of, of heat on the family. That was a definite mistake, but it wasn't one that ended up with him in prison. And I think that a lot of the bosses of today uh, who are known for their secrecy, you know, including the alleged boss of like the current Genovese family would probably be able to sympathize and say, too you know you're kind of a good to your lower lower levels um you know they're going to meet with your intermediary they're not going to meet with you yourself you know you you might get to see mike genovese at a making ceremony um but you you're not going to see him at at meetings very often um and he is two things that are two meetings where you know you can really see his uh management style in effect is uh, Nikki Scarfo came to a meeting in Pittsburgh to settle a dispute over uh, taxing a bookmaker. Mike Genovese didn't show up. 
uh, and sent one of his intermediaries border uh, to meet with him. Uh, despite the fact that, you know, that probably peeved Nikki Scarfo a little bit. Um, and then he also met with, uh, or, uh, the family met with in 1995 um, with Peter Milano from Los Angeles to get his permission to uh, own a, basically buy a casino out there in his territory in, near San Diego. And Mike wasn't there also. He, he sent, you know, his his acting street boss at the time was a guy named Henry Zotola. Um, so you could just you could just see in his actions how he was insulating himself against anything. As a boss, Mike Genovese was a respected leader and would even meet with the secretive Vincent Chingiganti in the late 1980s. As Paul Hodos explains. As I said before, the Genovese family was the Pittsburgh family's representative on the commission. And uh, they had a, uh, a pretty secretive relationship with Pittsburgh. Um, this is pretty much just single source information. There's not a lot on it. Um, clearly, Mike Genovese never flipped and Vincent Chingigante never flipped either. Um, so there's not much on it. It's pretty sparse. But the story is that uh, Mike Genovese, uh, just kind of during some of the prosecution troubles in the late 80s, brought a list of guys to the chin. And it was basically talking about making uh, quite a few new guys, um, The which, would, which is a big deal for Pittsburgh. I mean, Mike did uh, initiate uh, five new made members in the Pittsburgh family, which for the Pittsburgh family is a big deal. That's like, you know a quarter of their strength during the time when he was boss. It's, it was a small family as far as made guys are concerned. Um, so what he was going to do was going to create a big wave in Pittsburgh, I'm sure. Um, the Chin advised him to basically hold off until the prosecution troubles passed, um, which he must have thought was smart advice because he, he did do that. Um, and, you know, never really made anyone again after, after Henry Zatola, who was a, uh, apparently the last one. And uh, so he followed the Chin's advice to the letter um, up until the end of his life and really didn't make anyone again after that. The decline of the Pittsburgh family started in around 1990. Paul Hodos tells us a bit more on the final years of Mike Genovese and the fading fortunes of the Pittsburgh crime family. After the drug prosecutions and the, and the RICO prosecutions in the 80s and the early 90s, um, he retreated back into, uh, you know, his, his own world and only acted through a few trusted people. I remember I mentioned Henry Zatola, um, and, you know, after Porter, uh, that was his main go-to guy who was communicate with the street guys. Um, and, uh, and especially with Youngstown, which was still a, a very lucrative crew in the nineties. Um, and, you know, they weren't making anyone. Um, I believe out of caution. Um, there's no document that says that explicitly, but just based on actions, you can tell they're just being cautious. Um, and uh, the family started to dwindle from, you know, old age. Um, you're not inducting any new blood. Um, and, uh, you know, you you realize that, uh, you know, at one point he, his headquarters was a used car lot, basically, which is pretty low key. Um, and, uh, he would stay there for eight hours a day and, you know, doing the, doing the full work day, but also meeting with his men. And, you know, he was recorded inside that building. Now it, it, it didn't lead to prosecution because the stuff was just idle mob chit chat. And you could tell from the conversations that he was a boss and people even called him boss during those conversations, but they never discussed crimes. Every time they would bring up a crime, he would walk outside and walk around the block. Um, so that's how he continued to run it, you know, very carefully like that. Um, and, you know, they had uh, the the scheme where they were going to buy the casino out in San Diego to launder money through that. That that fell apart. Um, so they lost millions of dollars from that when law enforcement inter interceded and arrested Henry Zatola. And uh, and, you know, he lost one of his best guys with Henry Zatola who died shortly there after the prosecution too. So it was really a double hit and uh, he still had a few guys left, but really 
from what I've seen, it was just gambling left, you know, maybe a little bit of drugs on the lower levels, associate level. Um, but certainly none of, none of the made guys were going to touch the, the drug stuff again, especially after what happened in the, in the late eighties, nineties. Um, and they just seem to have been consigned to, Hey, there's a lot of law enforcement scrutiny on us. We're just going to let this family die. You know, you, you might call that the last hit he ever ordered was just on the family itself, you know? And when he died in 2006 on Halloween, October 31st, um, of natural causes, uh, the family was just a few members. They were all very old. Um, and, uh, only one was really super active and, and his name was Thomas Sonny, uh, Sun Uh, and he, uh, was pretty much the last made guy. And also, you know, you could say the last de facto leader of the Pittsburgh family. Um, and, you know, from, from the few documents I've seen from that time period, um, I don't think federal law enforcement was focusing on it since it was so small at that time, you know, there, there was, maybe like a city work contract scam going on. They were still doing the gambling stuff. Um, and, you know, he still had respect in places like Youngstown, Ohio and, uh, and, and Pittsburgh, obviously, and a few other places, but, and he was, he was, a, he was a widely respected figure, a, a known figure, I'd say, but post Genovese, it was really like a family on its last legs. And, uh, and, you know, when, when, Sonny died in 2021. The the family was done. There are still some associates hanging around that that are doing, you know, still running gambling. Uh, but no made guys and uh, no no evidence that anything of an organization is still left there. And that's what I've heard from some of the guys that used to work this stuff back in the day too uh, on the law enforcement side of things is that it's dead. Um, and uh, and. Mike Genovese, for all intents and purposes, was the last real godfather who actually had made guys under him. For anyone interested in learning more about the Mafia in Pittsburgh, check out Paul Hodus's excellent book, Still City Mafia. I've included a link to this in the comments below. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.